Shalom, shalom, chavim. Uh, peace to those of you that are my friends. Shalom to the friends out here. Uh, today I'll do this one in English. Kind of had a little bit on my heart the other day to do the, the video in Hebrew. But uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about some things that uh, I guess uh, we would probably call conjectures. Uh, it's some of my own thoughts uh, from the observations that I make from the Torah. And I want to share them uh, both with my uh, Israeli brothers and sisters as well as my uh, uh, Christian friends that watch these videos as well. So you, you may find this kind of interesting. And I want to start with you out of uh, the book of Exodus, uh, Shemot in Hebrew. And I'm going to read to you in the Hebrew language, but I'll also read to you in English, uh, translating this as we go. And uh, but before we get started, let me just mention something to, to you guys, uh, especially the, those of you that believe and support uh, the ministry. And when I say support, I mean with your prayers. Uh, that's the most important thing to me. I have studied the Hebrew language for many, many years. And uh, of course, it's not my native tongue. English is my native language. But early in life, the Lord dealt with me about the Hebrew language. I, I, I had two visions when I was younger. One of those visions, when I say visions, and I'm not talking about dreams, I'm talking about actual visions, the Lord showed me speaking in a language that I had never known before. And I believe that it was the Hebrew language. And all my life he's dealt with me about the Hebrew language. And when I first began to study Hebrew, I had a lot of problem, a lot, because I, I, I struggle in learning, learning new things. Uh, most of the things that I understand are just things that God has given to me, not because I understand it with a great intellect, but more from uh, inspiration. And the Hebrew language has been no different. It has really been the grace of God that I've learned it. I, I have studied uh, on university level as far as Hebrew, uh, so I understand uh, the breakdown of words, but even um, more so that, again, is just inspiration that God has given me. And, but I recall one day back years ago, in fact, I, I want to say it was when I was living in Israel. I can't recall exactly when this happened, but I was really frustrated in studying the Hebrew language. I'd been to an opan, um, and I went before the Lord in prayer and really cried out to him saying, you know, God, I just don't have the ability to learn this language the way I believe that you want me to know it. And after a very serious prayer, the Lord led me to the scripture. Actually, I just opened the Bible uh, and I, cause I told him, I said, show me something that will help me to know what you have a desire for me. And I opened to the very scripture where God says to Moses, I will be with your mouth and I will teach you what you shall say. And not knowing that years later, uh, that there would be research made on my name to see if my name was actually in the Bible code. Uh, there were several people that were interested. Uh, and even myself, I began to look, I know how to do the Bible code. And one rabbi in particular uh, did search my name as well, uh, this very well-known Bible code expert rabbi. And he said to me in an email that he said, your name appears 32 times and it's all in the book of Exodus. Uh, which I thought was kind of ironic because that's where God deals so much with me as about the children of Israel and their exodus. Uh, by the way, we have three exodus that will take place with Israel. First one has already happened, we know. I believe the second one has already taken place, Israel coming to their homeland. And I believe the third exodus or the final exodus is actually when Israel is uh, redeemed during the last seven years, uh, as Christians call it, the tribulation period. Um, that's also written in the book uh, Yam Suf. You can find find the, the, the interesting points there. But at any rate, when my name was searched in the Bible code, ironically, the name Danun appears in the very passage, in the very verse, uh, at a skip space of 17, uh, minus 17 actually, my name appears in the Bible code, where in the verse where God says to Moses, I will be with your mouth and I will teach you what you shall say. So I have always felt strongly in my heart that God is intending to restore, as he says in Zephaniah, a pure language. Zephaniah, I think it's chapter 3, verse 9, uh, unto our people. And it would be at the time that he would gather all nations down to Israel. I feel like that this is the hour that is now approaching. 
And so I'm asking you to really be in prayer for me because when I say a pure language, not that I can't speak Hebrew as it is, but there's something that he wants to do to where we would better understand who Moshiach ben David is. And that pure language, that restoration, for even when God says to, to Moses, uh, or Moses says to God, they will ask me, what is your name? That's always stuck with me, that scripture there, because I know Israel is still looking to know the divine name of God. How do you pronounce it? And so they don't try to say it because they don't want to break the commandment of God, take not the Lord thy name, God's name in vain. They want to be able to say it and know what his name is. And I think we're approaching that time. Anyway, let me take you then to the scripture here. I want to read to you something. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, dimensions. Uh, I know I, I, I went into this a little bit with you already, but let me just kind of uh, quickly go through this so we don't waste too much time. Uh, and by the way, I'll put that Bible code up on this video. It should be up at the time while you're watching it now. Uh, anyway, it says... Um, Oh, gosh, where are we at here? Um, oh, I'm right here in, in the book of Exodus. Oh, here we go, right here. Okay, this is after God sees Moses turn aside. He says, And God calls out from the middle of the, of the thorn bush, and he says, Moshe, Moshe, Veyomer. And Moses says, Here am I. El chalum lecha me'al uh, Take off uh, your, your shoes from off of your feet. Ki hamakum asha ata omed. For the ground on which you are standing, alav uh, uh, alayav adamat kodeshu. This ground is holy ground. And I start with this right here because what's fascinating to me in this particular passage here is that Moses, um, he says there that the ground on which he stands is holy ground. Now, I have argued, and, and, and really, I say not so much argued, but I'm really of a strong persuasion that the reason why God brings Moses to this place, I believe in another dimension, this is where the Garden of Eden actually uh, not only once stood, but still stands to this day. Because you have to remember when God, um, he drove out Adam and Eve from the garden, and then he put the, the angels there to guard the, the way to the tree of life. Uh, I have believed ever since then that this is, you know, that, or, or recently I've felt that this may be where it was. And the reason why I say that, because he says that the ground, Adamat, called a shoe, is a holy ground. Why would that ground be holy? And, of course, Adam's name is actually taking, taken from the word Adamat, from the ground, Adam, from the ground. And, uh, but it's a holy ground, and I believe it's because it's where maybe, perhaps, this is just perhaps a speculation, that God actually first formed Adam. And so in, in bringing this point out, I want to start, let's take a look at a few things here that you may find kind of interesting, and we're going to go to, um, I've got notes scattered all in here, it's really a mess the way I have everything. Um... Let's see here. Uh, well, let's, before we get too deep in it, let me just take you back to Genesis in chapter 2. Um, and let's go with verse 5. Now all the trees of the field were not yet on the earth, and the herb of the field not yet sprouted. For Hashem God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to work the soil. A mist ascended from the earth and watered the whole surface of the soil. And Hashem God formed the man of the dust of the ground, and he blew in his nostrils the soul of life, and man became a living soul. Now remember, verse 7, as I've told you before, um, it says here, um, okay, let me back up. Instead, uh, Adonai, or Hashem Elohim, et ha Adon, uh, see, there it is. He forms af, uh, the word afal, afal min hadama, from the ground. He formed him from the ground. And so I, I kind of wonder this. Now, there are several things. I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit here with you, and I don't even really intend to jump around with you. I'm not trying to confuse you. But it's just some things that I want you to think about that you might find a little fascinating in here. 
Uh, also in Genesis chapter 2, if we go on down, let's just continue to read. So Hashem God planted a garden in Eden to the east and placed there the man whom he had formed, and Hashem caused to sprout from the ground every tree that was pleasant, pleasing to the sight and good for food. Also the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10, watch this verse carefully, okay? A river issues forth from Eden to water the garden. Now, this is interesting in itself. It doesn't... I know the, 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 the rabbis translate this from, I think in the Christian Bible, let me just look and see. I think they actually translate it more accurately in the Christian Bible, but let me just look at that real quick for you to see. Uh, Genesis chapter 10. I think it, in Christian Bible it says, out of Eden. And I think it stumbled the rabbis, so they translate it from, and that's not correct either. It would still be the word out. And now a river went out, yeah, went out of Eden to water the garden. And I noticed that myself. How can a river come out of Eden and water the garden when the garden is in Eden? It doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Um, but let's, well, let's just, I'm going to read it over here to, to you in the Hebrew language. Ve'yatzmach um, Hashem uh, Elohim min hadama kol eitz nechamal, okay, betov, okay, let me get down where it's at. Uh, the tree of life and the tree of, uh, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, here it is. Venaha, which is a river, and a river. Yotse min edon. See, a river is coming out of Eden. Lehashakot et hagan. And it's watering the garden. Now, when I read this, I could not help but think, that it's a multi-dimensional realm in order for, 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 for Moses to write about it like this, to say that, you know, there's a garden in Eden, but yet that the river that waters that garden comes out of Eden and waters the garden. So how can something come out of something and water something that's inside of somewhere? It, it, it just really kind of seems awkward to, to think something like that. Uh, but then again, as I'm saying, I'm looking at where God brings Moses to the backside of the desert over here at Mount Sinai in, in northwest Saudi Arabia, and all the evidence that was discovered by Ron Wyatt, Vivica Pontian, and uh, the Caldwells, Jim and Penny Caldwell, just phenomenal. Uh, Leonard Muller as well, uh, Bob Cornuke, some other ones there. I, I'm trying to, I don't want to forget everybody that's done work over there. But the evidence that's been discovered there, I know even Ron Wyatt found some, uh, some of the very ancient Hebrew writings on those rocks, buried one of them in the sand so that it would not be taken away by the Arab people and, and, and discarded. Um, but the altar that is there, you can see there, you can just go back and research some of the work that these people have done and, and see this incredible uh, stuff. But um, uh, the top of the mountain is burnt there. I wish I could show you some of this, but I, I can't because I don't have permission to do that. It's in the book, though. I, do, I was given permission to put the pictures in the book from uh, Penny Caldwell and her husband, as well as Vivka and, um, and also uh, Ron Wyatt's uh, late wife, Mary Neal Lee Wyatt. Um, but anyway, at, at, at this point here, one of the most fascinating things is the rock that Moses smites in that wilderness journey. Now, I've talked to you a lot about the rock and showing you in redemption how that rock represents Mashiach and how that Yeshua, Jesus, fulfilled so much of the scriptural basis on that. But right now, I don't want to get into that. I want to discuss with you the fact that that rock is actually there. And there is a 60-foot rock that is split right down the middle and, of course, as I believe, it is actually a representation of Adam and Eve. When God created them, he split Adam and created two separate beings from there. And that water of life that was in them, that was breathed in them from the very beginning by God himself, was breathed into them from the Eitz Chaim, breathing in Nefesh Chaim into them, breathing the breath of life or, the, or, or God's own life into their bodies and in a plural form. But when the water is coming out of the rock, when Moses is commanded of God to smite this rock and the water comes out, where does that water come from? We hear so much from the evidences that these different uh, researchers have, have discovered there 
that everything on the base of the rock, all the rocks coming down that hill are all washed smooth. You can tell it was a tremendous amount of water coming through there. There is dried up river beds there where this water was flowing there. The, the, the children of Israel drank from this water and they lived. Now, oddly enough, we also find in the scripture that their clothes did not wear out. Their shoes did not wear out for the 40 years while they were in the journey. And yet that rock, as far as I'm aware of, there's no huge hole that goes down into the ground where this water could have come from. I believe that this is another proof that the river that came out, Yotse min, min, uh, Edon, from Eden, that came, the water that came out from Eden, that watered the garden which was in Eden, is actually from another dimension. And I believe that what it was, that when Moses struck that rock, he kept that other dimension. And that water that's in Eden, in the other dimension, that river, the Nahar, literally come out of that rock and into the very realm that they were in right there. And I also believe that that may have very much contributed to the reason why their clothes didn't wear out, uh, their shoes didn't wear out. I mean, imagine the purity of that water. Uh, just incredible. And of course, it represents life. It represents eternal life. Uh, the water does itself. So just something for you to think about. Uh, uh, another thing I wanted to share with you while we're talking about these things is, is um, and then we'll kind of end the video here in just about three or four minutes here, uh, is the water in Genesis where God, when he's first creating, um, let me go back to this again too. I actually wrote, maybe I think I'm missing something here. Okay, let's, let's take a look also though at um, uh, going back to Genesis uh, chapter 1. Uh, where it says, Bereshit bara lehim v'et ha-shemayim v'et ha-aretz. In the beginning, or at the first, God created the heavens and the earth. V'cha-aretz ha-yata tohu v'bohu v'choshek al-pane tohum. Okay, now, and, and, the, um, and when the earth was uh, uh, completely empty, astonishingly empty maybe, with, with darkness upon the surface of the deep. Now the choshek, this is what, I was actually bringing this out to my Jewish brethren in Hebrew the other day, Choshek. The word Choshek and also the word Nachash, which is the Hebrew word for the serpent, are basic, they're, they're, they're very much, they're rooted using the same letters from one another. Words, the, in other words, uh, Choshek, we never find anywhere where God says that Choshek is good. Um, and this is something that's interesting. It's kind of tough to follow this, but just keep in mind as, you, as I tell you about this real quick. So the, 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 the darkness is just covering everything. And then it says, Ve'ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, Me'achafet al the Spirit of God is brooding over the face of the waters. Okay? Ve'yomer Elohim, Yahi od ve yahi od, and God said, "Let there be light." Now we translate that "Let there be light," but really, "Let there be" is not in the in, in, it's not there in Hebrew of what you're reading there. Yahi od is really it's God becoming tangible in the dimension that we're living in. It is God. I use the expression giving birth to Himself. Um, this, this light here, we know, cannot be the sun. As I told my brother, and it is not uh, Shemesh. It's not the sun, because the sun is created later down in Genesis. So this light, no, without any question whatsoever, had to have been God bringing himself into existence. And I actually took my brethren over to John out of the Christian Bible, uh, Yohanan, uh, in the first verse where he says, In the beginning was the word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, which drove me to want to know if John notices that this Word, the first Word that ever comes out, and he, and he finds it in Genesis, because he says, and, you know, at the beginning, and it's even translated in the Christian uh, Hebrew scripture there, Bereshit, you know, he says Bereshit at the beginning. Um, uh, gosh, I don't have that one here. I would read that for you as well in Hebrew, but... Uh, he talks about how that that first word, or the, the in the beginning was the word Bereshit Haya Hadavar. That's actually how you say that in Hebrew. And so he says that. But the thing is, is that first word that was spoken by God was the Or. You know, the Yomer Elohim Yahi Or. So 
the light was the word, and then we find out that God says that the that the that the word hadavah, uh, who Elohim, it, you know, it, it it was it is God. So the first word, the light that is spoken in Genesis, is actually God Himself. And when I begin to look at this, I realize that then what we're looking at here, when God says this, He's not talking about. Uh, the sun and the nighttime and, and stuff like that right here at the beginning, he's talking about uh, creating, bringing himself into existence. And he says, Vayihi Od, you know, and it was like, you know, it, really the word Yahi is it's existence, it's, it's eternal. And, but watch what he says next. So just so it doesn't confuse those that, uh, that are trying to make sense of this in English here. Ve'yoe Elohim et ha'or kitov Okay, and God saw that the light was good. Ve'yavdil Elohim ben ha'or, he put, he separated between, okay, um, the or, ha'or, uven ha'choshek. He put, he separated between darkness and light. All right, now, this is where it's interesting. Then God says here, Ve'cha Elohim la'or, then he called the light yom, day, La Vela Choshek and for the night Kara Laila. Now that's interesting in itself because uh, just in case you may not know, when you say the word yom, we, we call that day. And that's why people get it mixed up thinking that it's like, you know, the sun instead of you know, I think the light is actually the sun. But God creates the sun later. The yod in the, the very first letter in there, we know that represents the divine name of God. But it also, the Yod is the center of the cosmic existence. Also, it is the center of individual existence, which provokes an eternal becoming of the individuality. And that's something I actually read uh, in a definition for the letter Yod when you're looking at the word Yom, and which perfectly begins to line up with God becoming tangible in our own dimension. Uh, and then you take the word Lila. Now, Lila is a mysterious word in itself. Um, but Lila also is, uh, when you go back in, I think it's in Isaiah, I forget exactly where it is in Yeshayahu, but one of the other places where Lila is used is uh, used as a monster or an, or an evil thing. Well, then if you begin to look at what I'm telling you here, that uh, the serpent, Nachash, and Hoshek, the darkness, are kind of like words that are related to one another there. Now, when you look at Isaiah, when it first speaks about Lila there, and showing that it is some kind of a monster or a beast and everything, it begins to line up with that as well. Uh, I, I can't say what everything on this means. I don't really necessarily know. But I know that God separates between the day and the night. He, puts a, he, put, he's, he divides the darkness from the light, but he's not talking about the daytime that we see now. I believe he's talking about separating from good and evil. And no place do we find in the scripture where God ever calls that night good. He doesn't call it good. And um, so, but anyway, so, and, 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 and um, let's just real quick, let's get cut out. Halayla. Vayi ere, vayi boker, yom echad. And he said, in the morning and the evening were the, were the, uh, the first day. The only thing that he said was good was the light. So the darkness, in this case, not like we see at nighttime. Nothing said good about that whatsoever. Now, another point that I find that was interesting is you go on down. Um, you know, he also, uh, when God, let's see, I'm wondering if that's further down or if that was, um, pardon me, just one second. Okay, yeah, let me just read a little bit more to you as well. Uh, then he says, he goes on to say, V'yomad Elohim, Yahi Rakia Betochamayim, and then uh, God, he puts a firmament in, the, in, in between the water, Ve'yihi Mavdil Ben Maim Lamayim. He actually puts a firmament between the waters, from the waters, or to the waters, and he says, Ve'yasa Elohim et ha-Rakia Ve'yavdil Ben Hamayim, Ashar Mitachat, um, and so he makes his, he makes a firmament between the waters which were beneath the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament and it was so 
And God calls, now here's what's in there, and God calls, uh, they, they call out to him, Lavakia Shemaim. He calls that firmament heaven. Vehi Ere Vehi Voker Yom Shne, Sheni, excuse me, in, in, in the morning and the evening is the second day. Now, that firmament, by the way, though, when we begin to read on and what he talks about in the firmament here, the firmament is, consists of the stars, the moon, the sun, everything. And so it just made me wonder then, where is this other water? Um, and as you begin to look, and, and this is one of the reasons why for the Jewish people, you know, it's an important for us to even consider some of the Christian scriptures because... Uh, we can find some of the answers to this actually in the Christian scriptures through the very words, even like, for example, with Jesus. And I was looking at one in uh, Luke, uh, the 16th chapter, as I'm studying this. And Luke brings, or Jesus is actually speaking here. Let me just find that for you real quick because the water separated from the water. I can't really say for sure what all this means, but I know that there is a song that is sung amongst Christians a lot, you know, living, he loved me, dying, he saved me uh, very far, he carried my sins far away. Um, and I know that there's the expression of, you know, he buried my sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Um, I know that the burying the sins in the sea of forgetfulness is actually taken from... Um, where is that at? That is in Micah, uh, is where the only scripture that we have that even refers to sins being buried. And it's actually when Israel is fully forgiven for all of their sins and iniquity. I know the last part of the verse reads, cast all their sins in the depths of the sea. That's chapter 7, verse 19. You can read that there when God finally will remember them no more and he casts their sins in this, uh, into the depths of the sea. And I believe that that sea is when Jesus himself, when Yeshua died, and he bore the sins of Israel away like the scapegoat was. He took those sins completely off of this earth. He carries those away. He goes into that other dimension. He goes beyond the separation there of the waters from the water, and he goes to the water on the other side. And that, I believe, is where he buries the sins of all of us, the sins of Israel and everything. And the reason being is because Satan can't get there. There's no way for Satan to go there and to dig your sins up. So your sins are not buried in any sea here where Satan has a, a, an ability to go and, and dig those sins up, but he takes it to, to, to that other separation. And here's what's beautiful about that, because Jesus points out in Luke 16th chapter, the 26th verse, he's given the parable about Abraham and Lazarus, the rich man, um, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, let's see, let me back up just one. And, and, and then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And it's in Lazarus that he uh, uh, may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool, cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and likewise in Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, watch us now. Between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Now that word in Greek, gulf, is not a body of water. It's a chasm. It's just a huge space in between. Okay, so think of it in a little bit different term. There's a great gulf fix so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Now, imagine then where Yeshua took our sins. No wonder why they send the scapegoat out into the desert to, to take the sins of Israel far away, out of the sight of God. And the same with the story of Joseph, when his brothers did evil to him, and he bore the sins of what his brothers did in his own bosom. And he carried them far away, down into Egypt, away from the sight of his father. So his father had no idea the evil that ever befell him. And the same we find with Yeshua when he was here. All the evils that Israel did. Satan's able to dig it up, bring it up. He does it all the time in this life here. I see it all the time on the videos, the comments that are made that are still against the Jewish people. For, what, for the things that happen. But Jesus will take those sins of Israel and he will carry them as he's already done 
He's taken them to that other side. He's the only one that can cross that chasm. And the only way you can cross that chasm is to have his life in you. Then you have the ability to cross to get there. But there's no coming back once you're there. And he took the sins of Israel and he buried them in that water.